Okay, picture this. You are standing in front of a bridge that just so happens to be crowded with an assortment of less than savory fellows. You recall coming across this bridge around 10 to 20 hours ago when you were <laughs> <clears throat> somewhat underpowered and therefore now approach this same bridge with an undercurrent of hesitation. You recall trying again and again, and yet, because you were a weak boy, also recall being unable to clear the bridge of enemies, and so now look upon your quarry with a mildly vindictive desire to take your revenge. But what if the same should happen again, and you waste precious resources, or break weapons that you'd rather save for more worthy foes? You could, uh, of course, just go around them and not bother with all this at all, but that won't satisfy your hunger for retribution, your longing desire to see the wrath of a million cerns burn down upon the miserable wretches that made a mockery of you before. No. What these particular enemies are deserving of is humiliation. You need a different strategy. You need to get creative. I have been a little obsessed with The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Released on the 12th of May earlier this year as the direct sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and the 29th major installment in this franchise, Tears of the Kingdom is a game that, well, it's honestly one at this point that none of you probably need me to even talk about. You've all likely heard about this game more than I could ever summarize. Do not be afraid. Releasing to what can only be described as a friggin' tsunami of critical acclaim and major commercial success, Tears of the Kingdom is an easy contender for 2023's Game of the Year, being lauded from all angles as an experience that both wonderfully innovates its predecessor's gameplay experience, especially for a franchise with nearly 30 games and counting, sweet Jesus, and also for its largely expanded sandbox world environment that proves time and time again to be, well, an absolute joy to explore. It's all old news at this point, and I've completely missed the party. Because I'm not actually what you could call a Zelda fan. See, unlike the literal millions of others who grew up around the same time that I did, I just never found myself getting into The Legend of Zelda. The only Nintendo console that we had in the family when I was a child was a SNES, which was great for Mario Kart, and I actually don't think we had any other games for it, I honestly can't remember. And then before long, I was gifted the video game console that would become my absolute lifelong favorite. The original PlayStation. And that was honestly it. I was still a Sony kid, and as a result of this, I have never played a single Legend of Zelda game. And I think that gives me a mildly interesting point of view. Having never played any of these games, aside from a brief stunt trying out Ocarina of Time for an hour or two, but I don't think that really counts, I really don't have a single opinion on these games. The story of this franchise, its gameplay, its world, its characters, all 29 games are a completely blank slate to me. In fact, it was only after buying Tears of the Kingdom for my wife and sitting down some evenings to relax and casually watch her play through it that I finally had something of an epiphany. I think it went something like, Oh my god, this game is so cool! So, yeah, one of the most influential and critically acclaimed game franchises of all time actually happens to be pretty good. Go figure, that's a big brain take. I am obviously not here to give you a lecture on how good or bad this game is from a Nintendo fan's point of view. I know absolutely nothing about this franchise, and while that might sound a tad sacrilegious and maybe makes several of you want to burn my transparent ass to the stake, I actually really loved not knowing anything about how this game fits in with the rest of the franchise. Like, Imagine for a second not knowing anything about the Elder Scrolls, and then playing Skyrim for the first time, waking up on that 
cursed little meme of a cart before witnessing the first dragon attack of the game, and then finally stepping out into its massive open world. A world where it feels like you can go anywhere, and you can do anything. This is exactly how it felt to play Tears of the Kingdom completely blind. Without a single inkling of where anything is or what anything even means. I mean, aside from the, the moments I'd seen while watching my wife, but never mind. That's a rare thing these days. And while I understand that Tears of the Kingdom is a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, and I probably should have played that game first, I can't help but feel pretty happy about the fact that I missed it because the elements that carried from Breath of the Wild into Tears of the Kingdom were still new and fresh to me, which only then made my time with Tears of the Kingdom feel so much more tangible as a result. Some of the most euphoric video gaming that I can recall in a very long time. <laughs> so, let's talk about it for a while. Let's talk about Tears of the Kingdom, a celebration of creativity. We begin our tale upon the awakening of an ancient evil and Princess Zelda going missing. Something that my wife tells me is not at all uncommon in this franchise, but there we go. Link loses his sword, an arm, and perhaps most importantly his clothes, before waking up in a cave on a massive cluster of islands that just so happens to be floating in the sky, to find that his arm has now been replaced by that of one from a long since dead ancestor of Hyrule, who also grants Link several abilities alongside his new appendage. And so you, the player, are then soon tasked with one simple objective. Find Princess Zelda. Sounds, uh, sounds easy enough. So, off you go. The game just lets you run free with barely a pat on the head and an attaboy. And it's after roughly five minutes or so of just casually wandering around that my first compliment was already being frantically tapped into my phone notes app. So, while I don't usually start by talking about a game's visuals before anything else when making these videos, it is here that we are going to officially start picking apart Tears of the Kingdom. This game is fucking beautiful. Visually, Tears of the Kingdom is nothing short of an absolute feast for the eyes. This was my first impression right off the bat, and as superficial as it may sound, it's the first that I want to present to you. The bright piercing sunlight that glows radiantly ahead as you approach the end of the cave that Link wakes up in, before then eventually stepping out to observe the gorgeous skybox before you, it's nothing short of breathtaking. Being one of the most similarly comparable elements to Breath of the Wild aside, the cell shaded animation is wonderfully rendered throughout this game, capturing a genuine sense of nostalgia for an older era of cell shaded games while still boasting the enhanced visual fidelity of a modern release. Not at all that dissimilar to the Nino Kuni franchise. And yeah, sure, on that subject, from a design point of view, the game is clearly borrowing some heavy influences, especially from the likes of Castle in the Sky, Norsker of the Valley of the Wind, and even Princess Mononoke with the whole arm rotting away due to an evil curse thing. They even look pretty similar, but it does so with a sense of adoring homage rather than just being a blatant ripoff. If you ever wanted a modern game set in the floating city of Laputa, Tears of the Kingdom is as close as it gets. And if you happen to be like me and are a huge fan of Studio Ghibli's 1986 classic, you are likely to want to spend as much time as possible exploring the floating ruins. There is so much life and vibrancy throughout Tears of the Kingdom's world design, so much so that it constantly goes beyond just the simple matter of making the game look pretty, especially when anything involving the Zonai are included, the ancient race that predated the Hylians. Everything design-wise regarding the Zonai takes on this somewhat modernized Mesoamerican aesthetic, with hints of Maya and Aztec designs woven throughout the mechanical nature of the armor, weaponry, and the robotic stewards or enemies. And you'd also be forgiven for the occasional nostalgic throwback to DreamWorks absolute classic, The Road to El Dorado. There's this distinctive focus on the use of golds, greens, and blues throughout the design of anything involving the Zonai. And while we are going to talk about the weapons and armor a little more later on, practically anything you find regarding the Zonai is a constant visual treat throughout this game. Like, look at this bow for instance. Look at the detail throughout this bow, or the shield upon Link's back. There's this familiar visual consistency throughout everything Zonai related of boxy right angles, squares, and these rigid mechanical aesthetics. 
which only becomes more elaborate once the more energy infused shields and weaponry starts to emerge. Notice how the defensive field on this shield gently ripples, or the fact that the fused gear mechanism on this sword continues whirring ceaselessly. Tears of the Kingdom is full to the brim of similarly creative visual designs. The multitude of little details pieced together to form the stewards or robotic Zonai enemies consistently keeps things visually interesting during your encounters with them. And placing your hand upon any of the Ouroboros Zonai mechanisms, such as the larger portals, or even something as simple as unlocking a chest, results in these delicate energy strands peeling away, rewarding every interaction with them with a subtly engaging animation so that from the player's point of view, you haven't just pushed what essentially amounts to a decorative button. It feels like you've genuinely achieved some minor accomplishment by finding, and therefore unlocking or opening whatever it is they might lead to. And it doesn't stop there. The more of the Zonai civilization that you encounter while exploring this game, the more out there and more elaborate they become. From these gigantic floating spheres, the colossal robotic wardens, which again, can't help but feel very closely familiar to Laputa's robotic guardians, or the megalithic labyrinths that tower ominously above you. Finding anything new regarding the Zonai is always a moment of intrigue. You never quite know what you're going to come across. And this is all before you even set foot on Hyrule itself. <gasps> Upon finally landing on the grassy plains, the game suddenly expands massively, now offering you three simultaneous huge maps. From the many mysterious sky islands scattered above you, to Hyrule itself with its many biomes and various individual civilizations, down to the ominous gloom world lingering just below your feet. Oh yeah, ah, uh, spoilers for Tears of the Kingdom? I won't be getting into the story too much for reasons I'll explain later, but I'll let you know when we're going to be talking about the more spoilery stuff when we get to it. Just bear in mind that this is very much a game that you should play before watching anything about it. You really do want your initial impression to be that intended little moment of awe when finding something new or interesting, so I do advise playing it before we go any further. Okay? Good. So, you have now unlocked the land of Hyrule and are now finally allowed to start rediscovering everything that you may or may not recognize from previous installments in this franchise. But again, from my point of view, this is all new territory. I've never seen any of this before, and even without any form of franchise nostalgia involved, it's territory that for the most part, I absolutely adore exploring. While the lack of any larger settlements, such as the cities or densely populated areas does kind of bother me, Yes, I know Hyrule Castle probably counts, but it's floating in the sky and isn't even that big. This is still a sandbox that is constantly doing everything it can to reward your efforts of exploring it. From broken structural ruins to wintry mountains, to vast stretches of desert or jungle woodland, the open world of Hyrule is thick and vibrant, whereas the threatening gloom world contrasts this with seemingly endless hills and deep craters of what mostly appears to be a dead landscape. It's fascinating to simply be in this world, to round a corner and see something new or unusual, to see a new creature or find a new herb or food item specific to the biome that you happen to be currently roaming around in. And yet, after 61 hours of traipsing around in this game, I can't help but feel I've barely scratched the surface. In fact, I know I haven't. While I certainly engaged in some of them, there were plenty of side quests or objectives that I simply outright ignored, because I was too preoccupied with exploring the game to bother, too intrigued by, oh, what's that over there? What's that giant floating cube in the distance? What's that large ominous looking monster hovering just barely within sight? Why is that volcano spitting demonic red goo and happens to be surrounded by a thick cloud of ash and smoke? Let's go take a look. 
And trust me, the act of let's go take a look, I wonder if I can get there, is an extremely compelling motivation in this game, because it often ties itself directly with another question, which just so happens to be the entire reason I'm making this video. How do I get there? <laughs> So as pretty much all of you probably know by now, you can very much Gary's mod your way through Tears of the Kingdom by means of Link Zone Eye abilities, the Telekinetic Ultra Hand, the ability to ascend through matter above you, the Recall, or Object Specific Time Reversal ability, and lastly the ability to fuse certain items together. And these four primary abilities are essentially the building blocks of what makes Tears of the Kingdom not only an immersive experience, but also a maddeningly addictive one. You will be endlessly finding yourself faced with an obstacle or a more difficult than usual enemy or a particularly exhausting looking journey, and the first thought that will most likely occur to you when weighing your options, aside from riding a horse, will be, sod it, let's see if this works. And then upon seeing your imagined solution come to life and actually work, feeling a wide, slightly insane grin spread across your face. I want to get over there, but I don't want to walk all the way around. Can't I just fuse a bunch of stuff together to make a bridge? Yes, you can. I need to get this shrine crystal from one sky island to the other, but I can't carry it. Can I make a catapult with several pieces of equipment and fire it over there? Yes, you can. That random minecart just casually lying on its side. Can I combine it with my crappy shield to make a goddamn skateboard? Yes, I bloody can. This is easily where Tears of the Kingdom's lure stems from. The seemingly endless variations of, well, I need X. Can I try Y and see if it works? and then having a humongous big brain in an explosion at your idea actually bearing fruit. Weird as it might sound, there are often moments throughout the game where I feel the same childish sense of giddy exhilaration as I once did when playing Dead Rising 2 for the first time. The innate understanding that slowly blooms as the game goes on, gradually revealing a mindset of, you can go virtually anywhere within this shopping mall, and you can do pretty much anything with whatever you find. That innocuous pile of wooden wheels all jumbled up isn't doing anyone any favours. Maybe I can just, oh I don't know, combine them with a few selective Zonai components to build a bike. Now granted, it's not a very good bike, and I don't exactly feel like I'm living out my dreams of an Akira themed open world cyberpunk game where you traverse New Tokyo hunting down Tetsuo using Kaneda's bike as your primary form of transport to get around. But I don't care, I built a motorbike in a Zelda game. Doesn't that just sound like a completely bizarre sentence? And yet within the world of Tears of the Kingdom, it's one that makes perfect sense. I can't remember the last time the phrase, fuck it, let's see if this works, has ever been so relevant to a video game experience, with the obvious already mentioned one being Gary's mod, but the less obvious and more recent likely one actually being Fear and Hunger. For those unaware, Fear and Hunger is a notoriously cruel horror RPG that massively rewards player intuition and experimentation. You will find it borderline impossible to complete the game if you do not allow yourself the freedom to take risks and try new things, or experiment with innovative item use, such as combining obscure items with equally obscure others, or making what I'm going to very, very tactfully refer to as interesting decisions in the hopes that you might progress forwards by doing so. And yet, when moments do occur and you suddenly find yourself rewarded for them while playing a game that can be painfully brutal at times, the inner euphoria of, oh my god, that actually worked, really isn't all that dissimilar to the mindset of Tears of the Kingdom. 
There were so many opportunities to explore the fuse ability by combining random pickups or fallen bits and pieces from enemies with others in order to create something that gives you a considerable advantage. This random bit of a giant boss monster laying on the ground. What if I just combine that with my spear and then oh my god look at the attack power. Or how about the use of the map itself? The game offers you several unique map markers to help you traverse and map out Hyrule's three separate zones, which are handy enough for remembering places worth visiting, such as trading hubs, zonai mechanisms, or groups of enemies that you can't defeat yet. But the real value in the map is in marking those locations where you're going to want to continually harvest useful food items that spawn en masse, or caves where you can mine valuable gems or materials for use in upgrading or purchasing new weapons and armor or marking areas where these insanely beneficial fairies spawn, a pickup item that saves you from death by way of a second chance mechanic. This is ridiculously advantageous for boss monsters that need a fair amount of work to bring down, so your ability to mark where they spawn gives that player a welcome means to harvest these when needed. All of this is at the player's disposal, the game isn't going to do it for you, but it's the player's own intuition that offers the reward as is virtually everything in this game. Not only can you build clunky, borderline hilarious contraptions such as my fondly named Wall of Death, you can also utilize several other zonai mechanisms to build cars, planes, rocket shields that send links several feet into the air, and the list just keeps going on and on. Honestly, while it didn't offer any massive benefit to the combat encounter, I think my proudest moment was in building a plane with the capability of firing homing missiles. Now sure, the Gleox still royally kicked my ass, but in the moment all I could hear was a delighted 5 year old voice internally screaming, oh my god I'm fighting a giant monster with a plane that I built in a Zelda game that fires friggin homing missiles. Now if we rewind all the way back to the beginning of the game, let's bear it in mind that the link you find yourself controlling has recently undergone a massive descaling of both health and defensive ability. Like many of its predecessors no doubt, Tears of the Kingdom very much hard resets Link at the start, which is not only an obvious natural decision so that your basic gameplay progression can take place, but it also doubles as something of a genius move on Nintendo's part when paired with the various abilities and mechanics available to the player. Starting the game with Link being severely depowered, both from the point of view of the player and in literally being disarmed via a maimed arm and shattered master sword, really marks the perfect starting point for a seasoned Zelda player or uninitiated newcomer. A blank slate to start afresh and allow the player to immediately decide on their preferred approach to his combat, and by extension, whichever weapons the player would prefer to not only collect, but also build. Every base weapon that you pick up is going to be one of three things, degraded due to the evil energy infecting everything it touches, built by a monster and therefore something of a mixed bag in terms of effectiveness, or a usually more powerful zonai weapon. And how useful these many weapons are is not only down to your familiarization with a particular weapon class, such as swords, claymores, spears and so on, but also in your own decisions when it comes to combining weapons with other weapons, or with the collectible materials that increase damage output. If you were, for example, to combine a spear with Another spear, you now have a weapon that offers you a massive advantage in terms of its range, therefore keeping pesky enemies away from you that may end up dealing damage to you when you aren't spongy enough to absorb it yet. Or why not fuse an ice shard to a weapon, therefore giving you a spear that lets you freeze enemies? Or how about fusing a laser to a shield, therefore allowing you to deal damage while blocking? Sure, it wears out pretty easily, but that's not the point. The game allowed you to do this. It allowed you to experiment with a, why not, let's see what happens. And this level of freedom is so ridiculously infectious that, if you're the kind of person again like me who loves in-game player freedom that allows you to approach problems with whatever you can think of, you can easily spend dozens of hours just pouring through the many different combinations available to you that not only play into the game's combat, but also its exploration. I want to cross this river, and I need to take a Korok with me, so why not use an ice spear to freeze chunks of water that lets me walk across? 
I need to cross this lava, but I don't want to be burned to a cinder. Why not use a Zonai water pump to solidify the lava and therefore cross it safely? Ah! Or, I am really, really sick of this shrine trial that requires a big ball to smack into this panel. So, sod it, let's fuse a bomb to an arrow, fire it at the panel, and holy crap, it actually worked. Wait, I can fuse things to arrows? So, by now, I've hopefully given you an idea of how goddamn addictive it is to simply play with the tools that have been handed to you in this game. But let's take a moment to talk about the combat itself, and how good it is. Because it is. It's really, really good. Hilarious as it might be to have the power to effectively create a B-52 stealth bomber and therefore reduce the poor fuckers to dust in the blink of an eye, engaging with Tears of the Kingdom's combat in a less elaborate manner is also really satisfying. Indulging in its fair share of inspired Dark Souls-isms that was even a trait that even I was aware of being used throughout Breath of the Wild by reputation, virtually any encounter with an enemy is one that feels fun and interesting to take part in. You often can't just blindly charge in without risk of severely pleading your health stores, so you need to consider things tactfully. Blocking, dodging, igniting Link's flurry rush, combat encounters in low gravity locations, or using a high jump to trigger the slow motion bow shots. With all of this in mind, most if not all of the fights with enemies of this game are legitimately fun encounters, especially when combined with the in the moment Zonai ability decisions that further bolster your damage output. Let's say you kill an enemy, and it drops a bog standard weapon and a trophy material, usually a horn or claw or something equally damaging. If you whip out your fuse ability while still in the heat of combat and successfully fuse the horn before the next enemy approaches, you now immediately wield a far more effective weapon than the one you had a few seconds ago. Or let's say you encroach upon a base of enemies and happen to notice several explosive crates dotted around. Well, I could run in and fight, or I could pick up the crates with my Ultra Hand and drop it on their heads. It's freedom of choice such as this that widens the entire spectrum of the game's combat. Fighting enemies isn't just a simple matter of hacking and slashing, although you will certainly be doing a whole lot of that, it's also essentially everything else you can think of. Let's say you don't want to fight the malevolent Gloom Hands, an enemy so bothersome that you'll want to set fire to their entire lair to ensure maximum assurance of death. It's the only way to be sure. Well, you can instead escape the Hands by quickly using the Ascend ability to casually shoot up high above their reach. Or let's say a Talus or a water-based monster is launching rocks or other projectiles at you, why not use the recall ability to reverse time on the projectile, therefore preventing it from hitting you and even sending it flying back at them? Or let's say you're fighting a Zonai Flux Construct, and happen to notice that its entire body is made up of things that you can move with the Ultra Hand. I could continue wasting my bombs and arrows and other things against it, which admittedly I did the first time I came across one, but instead I could use the Ultra Hand and just pull that big pain in the ass apart as if you were a kid bored with a Rubik's Cube. Now sure, your ideas don't always work. A wall of death against a talus is about as effective as tickling it with giant feathers, but the game still allowed you to try. It allowed you the opportunity to break the mold of regular combat and just try something new. Something innovative. Another particularly smug moment of the game, which I can't stop re-watching because it felt amazing at the time, was when I needed to traverse a long stretch of gloom and I happened to notice that an enemy was flying around on a plane beneath me. So I dropped down on the plane, killed the enemy, and then stole it. This isn't even taking into consideration the multitude of potions and attributing foods that you can create, which is a whole nother paragraph unto itself, but for the sake of the video's length, I'll keep it short. From speed to defense to attack, power, stealth, additional hearts, and so on. Really, if you get bored of doing something, just try something else. Because boy oh boy, is there a lot of try something else available to you. And in case you haven't realized yet, this is why this video is called a celebration of creativity. Because that is exactly what it feels like. 
Across the board, exploring Tears of the Kingdom feels like an endlessly limitless experience. You really do feel as if you can go anywhere with any method, and you can do anything if you set your mind to it within the boundaries of what the game gives you to work with. In fact, if there's any particular section of this game that does feel restrictive, it's the game's story. I've heard that voice. Are you the one who's been talking to us this whole time, Goro? Now, for the record, I don't think Tears of the Kingdom necessarily has a bad story, rather than it's just a functional one. But it's also one that often can't help but feel a little bit paint by numbers, which is the complete antithesis of the entire rest of the game. By the way, uh, spoilers for the story ahead. In following the main quest, the game tends to spend far too much time shoveling dialogue into your face or continuously bottlenecking the player's abilities. It's as if it's afraid that you might get through it too quickly, so instead you often find yourself focusing more on the straightforwardness of the game's combat or exploration, rather than on the flexibility of innovating your path through it, especially during your quests to retrieve the five sages, five companions to assist Link in his final battle. And they... they suck. I'm sorry. Well, except Tulin's. But that's merely because the location itself, fighting on a giant flying pirate ship, is cool as hell. I can't speak for the rest of the story outside the Sage stuff for reasons that I'll get into in a second, but virtually every single Sage quest is exactly the same thing. You get to a village, you find the Sage, you tick some boxes by accepting the quest, then opening some mechanisms or stopping another mechanism, you then watch a lengthy cutscene of the Sage getting Sageified, and that's it? Rinse and repeat for three or four more times, find out about Zelda, go fetch the Master Sword, and then kill Ganondorf. Is... is that it? The memories of Zelda cutscenes aren't honestly that much better either. They're nice to look at from a visual point of view, but they drag on and on, telling me things that certainly give the story context, but I can't help but feel they'd be a lot more interesting if I was a hardcore Zelda fan. But I'm not. Let's now compare that feeling to landing upon one of the Sky Labyrinths. You are standing in front of a massive labyrinthine cube, its entrance barred and towering walls rising high above you. You take a moment to weigh your options, options that are far more flexible than normally found due to this particular location inexplicably having low gravity, because this gigantic alien cube also happens to be floating in the sky, high above the terrain of Hyrule. Your first thought is, of course, to climb, but even with the relevant upgrades accumulated, this proves ineffective. You consider combining the climb with low gravity enhanced vertical jumps, but again you find yourself met with failure. You could use up the entire stock of stamina refilling items that you've meticulously gathered over the last 5 hours or so to then climb the wall, but in doing this you might end up wasting these for nothing more than a sealed box that refuses entrance. It's time to, again, think outside the box. First, you use your rocket shield, a piece of equipment that you have built for the exact purpose of reaching higher ground when climbing does not work, but it still proves ineffective. What are you going to do? Well, you could build a hover bike, or a hovercraft of course, but that also doesn't work because controlling these in low gravity is… it doesn't go well. And it's also because what you actually need to do is explore the labyrinth on the ground first, and then after doing so you can explore the upper labyrinth after the door opens, with each of the three being these genuinely captivating, somewhat unique locations. They're so mysterious and ominously megalithic that it feels as if you're encroaching upon forbidden territory, which is only then further amplified when you unlock the ground floor gate that leads into the third and final section of the labyrinth one that sits eerily below in the depths of the gloom world. And it was these labyrinths that were the turning point for me. It was at this point that I had then checked how much footage I had actually accumulated, saw that I had a total of 40 hours so far recorded, and yet at this point in my playthrough I had neither even begun to chip into the main story, nor did I feel that I had really scratched the surface of how much there was to obtain or see in this game. There was so much more for me to do so much more for me to explore. It's a pure, unfiltered example of the term sandbox. The world is your oyster, and it is a truly spectacular one. Except for when it comes to the majority of the main story. So, 
I decided to do something that I've never done before with a game that I intend to review. And because of that, it's now here that I'm going to offer you a holding statement. This video is not really a review. I'm not covering every aspect. This video is already way too long and I am not the person to tell you if this entire game is good or not within the realms of the Zelda franchise. For me, it's simply an opportunity to tell you how much I adore the creativity in this game. And I'm okay with that. Because after finding my third sage and seeing how redundantly repetitive it is to gather them, especially the fifth one, which we're not going to talk about, I decided to do things a little differently. I skipped the story. See, I had heard an interesting little rumour about Tears of the Kingdom, that you could fight Ganondorf at any time, regardless of your story progress. And sure, doing so without the power of the sages is likely a much harder task, but that's when an idea dawned on me. What if I could defeat Ganondorf without the missing sages or the Master Sword? What if I only used the things that I've learned and the three sages I already had on hand? Surely the game wouldn't actually let me do that, right? Well, that right there, that's an interesting little challenge, and one that I could not help trying out for myself. I decided I would disregard the remaining sages and any ambition to possess the Master Sword. I didn't want to go through any more of it, I was tired of going through the story missions. I would fight Ganondorf now, on my own terms. And imagine my absolute delight when it not only worked, but the game had even anticipated it. First off, infiltrating Hyrule Castle. But you don't even really need to do that, just jump into the portal below and boom, you suddenly find yourself fighting hordes of enemies that are far more powerful than any you've come across before. The gloom effect of enemies can also break your health hearts, therefore preventing you from healing normally. So throughout this section, I resolved to sprint through as quickly as possible. Remember those rocket shields I keep mentioning? Well, those are very, very useful for situations such as this. I bypassed room after room of enemies, stopping to fight some and spawning Zonai robots to fight others in order to turn the tide. Because as it turns out, your sage bodies often get yoinked away from you throughout this section, which kind of makes you wonder why you bothered spending so much time gathering them in the first place, but never mind. Finally, I reach the main combat area, where hordes of the demon army spawned in waves after waves. And it was at this point that I started to wonder if I'd maybe bitten off more than I could chew. Except there was one more ability that I haven't talked about yet. The order build ability. See, once you earn this ability by exploring the Gloom World, you can save previously built designs to a menu, therefore allowing you to spawn these completely assembled by spending Zonai Minerals. This is a massively useful ability if you happen to be in the heat of combat and need to spawn something quickly, and it is one that I use to its fullest extent. I smashed through the demon army, spawning Zonai homing robots with missiles and other weapons, or by spawning vehicles that allowed me to fire Goro's attack repeatedly without needing to continuously run up to him, which is very, very annoying when he keeps running away. And all the while, I was keeping my eyes out for dropped enemy materials that would further boost my weapon's attack power. Every time one went down, my immediate response was to quickly equip a non-fused weapon and then fuse the material, replenishing my rapidly depleting weapon stocks every time one breaks due to the game's weapon durability mechanic. I spawned fans to use my Kai and countless rockets to equip my shields, therefore allowing me to repeatedly fire up into the air and safely hover for ranged attacks, raining hellfire down upon my enemies with every equipable arrow component that I could think of. Bombs, ice fruits, fire fruits, you name it, I was shooting it at them. And with every successful defeat of a wave of enemies, the fact that I had simply used the power of my own creativity was more exhilarating than I can possibly tell you. Sure, I died a couple of times, but it didn't matter. I defeated the demon army, missing two sages and without the Master Sword using only my learned knowledge of how to use these contraptions and the tools given to me. And then, Ganondorf himself stepped forward, and I defeated him. On my very first try. Mm. 
You see, I had taken some time to harvest a few very powerful weapons for this particular encounter, and also spent a good deal of time building up my stocks of potions and food and fairies that would allow me to not only overcome the gloom effects on my health bar, but would also increase Link's physical attributes to therefore avoid damage or at least take it with some reduced effects. My weapons started breaking, my stockpile of materials plummeted, I ran out of arrows, I almost ran out of food, Ganondorf's Shadow Clones had already shown me how easily he could destroy my Zonai contraptions, and still I kept going, breaking through Ganondorf's defenses with everything I could think of to give Link the edge in a battle that I had deliberately chosen to enter with only half of the game's story-related assistance. And then, at the peak of the battle, after finally defeating Ganondorf's smaller form and witnessing transform into a mighty demon dragon, the game rewarded me with one more surprise. It knew that I could be the sort of player who might do this. It knew that canonically, the Master Sword is required to defeat Ganondorf. So it gave it to me. Link drew the Master Sword from the transformed Zelda Dragon's head right before the very moment of defeating Ganondorf's dragon form, and I won. I cannot tell you how monumentally thrilling that was. To know that I had defeated the game, not by ticking the boxes that it wanted me to, but in approaching it in a way that I personally found more enjoyable. And yeah, sure, this approach to Zelda isn't exactly new or innovative. Players across the world have thought up countless ways to make the games purposefully harder by neglecting its rewards, but in that exact moment, it felt absolutely incredible. And the fact that the game maintained its continuity to acknowledge this decision was such a wonderful nod to that, to wink at the player as if the developers knew that this very mindset or perhaps raw stubbornness might emerge from their player base. I completed Tears of the Kingdom's story by essentially ignoring Tears of the Kingdom's story. So, yeah. Like I said, this video really isn't a full-blown review. Not really. Again, I'm hardly in a position of experience with the franchise to offer an informed opinion on how it compares with the previous installments. With this particular game and franchise, that's not really a perspective I have. And I'm sure that by now a few of you are already considering the many different ways the phrase HOW DARE YOU SKIP THE STORY, THAT'S NOT HOW IT'S SUPPOSED TO BE PLAYED can be left in the comment section. But for me, this was still an incredible experience. I spent 61 hours playing Tears of the Kingdom. And while I certainly approached it on my own terms, and I skipped the majority of the story, I still had an absolute blast with this game. Let's be honest, if you're a Zelda fan, there's nothing I can tell you that you probably already haven't heard before. But for me, again, this video is just an opportunity to tell you about a game that truly, absolutely values player ingenuity. About how I couldn't stop thinking about new ways to approach the building mechanics, or the weapon fusing combinations, or how often I caught myself grinning at the sheer glee of it all. Tears of the Kingdom is not a perfect game, but it is one that I would happily spend another 61 hours playing. It is, hands down, a celebration of creativity. Hey everyone, thanks for watching the video. I'd like to thank my amazing top Patreon supporters, Game Master, Darkraptor86, BFD Survivor, and Chikotsky. This video was a bit of a detour compared to my usual video style, especially considering that it wasn't really a quote-unquote review, yes I need to stop saying that, I know. It was definitely more of a lengthy brain tangent until I ran out of things to say, but I hope you liked it. I'll see you next time.